Hi, good morning. You can have your full time. I won't. What's that? You can go for your full. Okay, cool. Thanks. Can you guys hear me in the back? Does this work okay? Yeah? Should I bring it up? Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, Brandon, Hank. Uh, let's give a nice little shout out to the Seller Labs guys for, and ladies for pulling this all together. Oh, that's a great question. Hey, Jeff, when are you going to make these slides available to the group? this thing, is it working now? Is it staying on? Okay, great. Um, so yes, my name is Peter Kearns. I'm the owner of P. Kearns Consulting. I'm the founder of the AIM Group. It's a small community uh, that's launching in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's the Amazon Insider Mastermind Group. Um, and I am a former Amazonian. And so before we get started, I just want everyone to take out your laptops, start Excel. Um, I'm just kidding. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Uh, no, what I really do want you to do, though, is take out that notebook that Seller Labs gave you and grab a pen because you're going to need it in a couple of minutes. So today we're going to talk about a data deep dive, interpreting data to make smarter business decisions that achieve goals. Uh, my background, I have 15 plus years in advertising, marketing, retail, e-commerce. I've been a seller since 2013. And I was an Amazon marketplace leader for about three and a half years on the seller services side. I've worked for companies like J. Crew, the Discovery Channel, Coach, the Seattle Times, and Amazon. While I was at Amazon, I was the leader of uh, new seller recruiting for the baby, for the consumables categories, baby, beauty, grocery, health and personal care, personal care appliances. Um, how many, just real quick, how many sellers, I know Jeff asked it, but how many sellers in here are uh, resellers, only resellers? Very interesting, very little. What is that, four or five? And then the rest of you are all wholesale, uh, private label or brand owners or a combination? How many of you are a combination? Okay, very cool. Uh, so yes, I was there running that team for about three and a half years. Uh, my team, we launched about 1,500 sellers. Um, now they're collectively doing approximately 500 million a year in uh, gross merchant sales. I was involved with six Jeff B escalations. Anyone in here ever emailed Jeff Bezos? I can, do you want me to tell you about it, the first one? Uh, uh, real quick, the first one was on a Friday morning. I remember I'm on the bus coming in and my manager, Chris Larson, he says, sends me a text, PK, uh, Jeff B, get ready. And I'm like... <laughs> So I get into the office and I'm thinking, I'm gonna get fired, right? Because this seller wrote in to Jeff Bezos, Dear Jeff, I can't tell you how excited I was when Peter Kearns called me. I'm like, oh, that's not that bad, right? However, I can't tell you how disappointed I am that it's been two months since he called me and he has not returned my phone call. And so I'm like, well, what is this guy? Who is this guy? And what, he had, what, what the problem was is he had written in asking for a UPC exemption. Remember those days where you could just write in and get a UPC exemption and list whatever you want? Yes. So he writes in asking for a UPC exemption. First of all, he's an individual seller. He's not a pro seller. So he doesn't have access. He's not approved to do that sort of thing. Second of all, his images don't meet requirements and he's only got one product. So I called him to coach him through this thing. Uh, and obviously I didn't call him back. And so the thing about it though was that the question that we answered was, why did he have to write into us? Why did he have to wait two months? And so we answer the five whys. If you've ever heard me speak at these other conferences, I've talked a lot about the five whys, which is going upstream to figure out exactly what was wrong. So we go and we find out what's wrong. And from this one email, we end up realizing that the teams that were doing this and that there were thousands of other sellers that had been impacted by this same failure. And we realized that this wasn't working we actually ended up completely shifting our team, refocusing resources, and building an entire new team based on that. So they work. They take them serious. You may only get one of those, hey, I'm so-and-so from executive relations. Jeff B asked me to reply. A lot of these happen. A lot of these get pushed to him. He either responds with a question mark or a smiley face, and it gets waterfalled down to the appropriate teams. So they are listening. Uh, and then for me, obviously, I didn't get fired. I just ended up having to write a six-page document that weekend. 
It was really, it was great. It led me to kind of learn that I got, I earned my Amazon MBA. How many people in here have an MBA? Right. But how many people in here are selling over $100,000? I mean, like making some significant money, right? So that's the thing. You don't need to have that credential to be successful. So real quick, why I wanted you to get out your notebook is I want you to write down your business goals for 2017. And I'm being serious. Take a second, write these down, because this is kind of the foundation for what this conference is going to be about. And I'm serious, your answer should be a specific number. Write down how you're going to achieve these, this goal. It could be a sentence, it could be one word. Now take a second, in true Amazon nature, they, we do a thing uh, there, it's called a WBR, a weekly business review, and you're in this room with your vice president and your directors, and they're project, you're projecting your numbers up on the screen, it's a big Excel spreadsheet, Mike, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the, the KPIs, the key performance indicators, the five metrics that you're being based on, what your goals are, they're either highlighted in red, yellow, or green. Red obviously means you're not hitting your goals and you got questions to answer. Yellow means you're maybe close, you're right on the verge and you've got other questions to answer. Green means you're hitting your goals and then you've still got questions to answer, right? So what I want you to do now is take a second, you know what your goal is, you've talked a little, you've thought a little bit about how you're going to achieve it. Are you red, yellow, or green right now? How many people wanna raise their hand if they're red? No one likes to admit it. Everyone in here? You're all, you're red, uh, nice. All right, I like to say that. Like, anyone yellow? Lots of yellows. Anyone green? Robin's in the back, I like that. So we're gonna talk today about data. So keep these, these goals in mind, everything, right? And data's really trendy. Right? It's really cool. Everyone's talking about big data and how you can get access to all this thing. Seller Labs is all about like, building these reports and building these data. Um, lots of tools out there, uh, lots of solution providers out there. But data doesn't mean anything unless you have the ability to interpret it. So Gary King from Harvard University was talking about big data is not about the data. And his point here is that having access to big data is important, but the real value is in the analytics. The real value is being able to look at that data, knowing what to do with that data, how to make decisions with that data that are gonna positively impact your business. So while I was at Amazon, I ran that team. Every year in this uh, early summer, they start doing a pro, uh, thing called OP1. It's where your strategy, you're writing a one-year plan doc. And you write this doc, and you basically say, okay, this is my team, this is what we're gonna do next year, here's how we're going to achieve it, here's our numbers, here's our goals. You present this doc to your VP and your directors, you sit in this room, and in Amazon, everything's done on uh, white papers, so two pagers or six pagers, you give them, they read it, and then you sit there waiting for them to mark it up, right? <clears throat> so my uh, directors, my VP, they read over the doc, Lots of great questions, really good dialogue, right? And I'm really excited. I'm like, yes, this is going to get me promoted. And so my team was a relatively small team. Um, and uh, we were doing a small amount in the consumable space. It's a relatively low ASP, uh, average sale price. And so we were going to take my group and turn it from that was generating 12 million a year and have them generate 25 million. So I'm like, sweet, we're going to 2x our business. They didn't like it. They wanted me to go from 25 million to 40 million in a matter of months. So I'm like, I gotta go to 40 million? This is insane. And I don't get any more headcount? I don't get to hire anybody? So I'm sitting there and I'm asking myself, how am I gonna go from 12 to 40? I'm gonna analyze the data. Amazon has access to all this data. They have this thing called Data Warehouse. I, you mentioned it at Prosper, yeah, it's like, oh, data warehouse is down. <laughs> but it's this huge data pool, and they have BI guys and girl, women who are coming in and you know, analyzing this data for you, right? So they give you, you have access to all this data. So you analyze the data, you interpret the data, 
You establish a strategy, and then you work backwards from your goal. So this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to take 12 to 40 million in a matter of months. So what am I going to look at? Well, me at Amazon, I have access to tons of data, right? You sellers have access to pounds of data, right? Not tons, but pounds. And so I'm going to be looking at this um, massive data set and looking at brands that um, have incomplete catalogs. So brand A sells 1,000 products, but there's only 100 of them on Amazon. I'm going to be looking at the A9 search results for abandoned sales because the product didn't exist. I'm going to be looking at listings, uh, the products that don't exist, um, no listings or underdeveloped browse, so like the tree hasn't been created enough so people can't discover it. I'm going to look for uh, low ranking BSR, right? Everyone's looking for low ranking BSR uh, and items with frequent stockouts. And then I'm going to be looking for zero or no FBA offers. So I gather all of this data, significant amounts of data, and then I start formulating this addressable market. I have now created what I want to go after. And so from there, I realize that I have all of these potential ASINs, this potential product, and I come back with, I'm going to find the right sellers. So first thing I got to do is find the sellers that have this catalog that I need. I'm going to make sure that they're selling these products, that they're selling the right brands, because I know that if I launch a particular number of sellers who have this particular catalog set, that it's going to achieve this goal. And I create a strategy for this. I create my goal, and then I work backwards from it. What am I talking about? So based on this addressable market that I've created, that I've found, I've realized I need to launch 800 sellers with the right catalog. So here's the 800. This is the output I'm going to generate. And the inputs I'm going to control they're going to launch with an offering count of about 1,200. So they're going to have a catalog with 1,250 ASINs of that ASIN type that I discovered earlier, right? These guys are going to generate about 50,000 in GMV in their first year. It's not a ton, but for a first year seller who's only doing it in a couple of months in some cases, now granted, Amazon's, my goal is from January to December. So if I launch them in, in June, I've only got six months of attributed GMS. So they've got to perform significantly. And those 800 sellers selling 1,250 ASINs, generating approximately 50K, are going to reach me to my $40 million goal. Did I do it? Barely. I did it like the week before Christmas, right? So this is how you do it. You create this addressable market. You create this group of goals or attributes, uh, levers that you can pull, and you create your goal and you work backwards from it. And so at Amazon, I had this great opportunity because I had access to a lot of data. And I keep going back to this data because that's kind of what we're trying to talk about here. And for you guys, you don't have access to that same kind of data. You don't get to see card abandonment. You don't get to see A9 search results that show that somebody searched for something and then they didn't buy it or stuff that doesn't exist, right? But you do have access to some pretty good data. And the problem that a lot of sellers have is that they don't know what to do with it. And I don't want to talk about something that's super complex. Or I don't want to talk about how you need to create this really you know, dynamic formula where you go after all of these things. You really need to start with two things. And I know that there's different levels of sellers in this room. There's some that are doing significant amount of money. There's some that are just starting, some that aren't in FBA. But I have, one thing I have learned over the years in talking with all my sellers is that most of them don't have a hard and fast ASIN strategy, and they have no idea what's really going on with their catalog. Anyone in here have an ASIN strategy for every single ASIN in your catalog? You do. Anyone in here know exactly what's going on with your catalog? Yes, you do. Okay, cool. So very. So where do you start? Right? There's all these tools out there. Seller Labs, uh, other, you know, tools and service providers you can buy into. Where you start, it's very simple. It's the detailed page sales and traffic by child item. How many people look at this report? How often? Every day? Every other day? Every two weeks? How many people have never heard of this report? 
This report is gold. It's the foundation. It's going to help you understand what's going on. It's located in your business reports. And there are different types, and there are some tools out there that aggregate a lot of this, but there's the main thing about this report is your sessions. Everyone know what a session is? So uh, session data is not available in an API, so it's hard to get it into some of these third-party solution tools. So this report, it's located in your business reports. It's the foundation for establishing your goals and strategy. It's going to give you your sessions. It's your traffic to your ASINs. It's going to give you your session percentage, your sales conversion. It's going to give you your buy box and sales. It's going to give you some other things like page views, but that doesn't really matter. It does not include profit. There's nowhere in here to put your profit in. So this is really, really important, though, because all about this, what we're doing on Amazon is generating profit. If you're not making any profit, you're not going to be around for very long. So you need to have an individual ASIN strategy. And what I tell my sellers, what I tell um, friends, anybody that's selling on Amazon, is every ASIN in your catalog needs to be generating a minimum of 1,000 sessions per month. Sessions are a unique IP address to your ASIN in a 30 day, in the time period, once in a 24 hour period. So if I go to your ASIN once today, that's one session. If I go back two hours later, that's one session, two page views. Page views will always be higher. So sessions are the key. There's 97 million unique visitors to Amazon each month. Everyone in this room is competing with each other. I don't care if you sell in a different category, you're like, oh, we don't compete. We're in a different category. BS. Everyone in Amazon is competing for a piece of that traffic, period. So there's 97 million unique visitors. All year asked, million, almost 100 million unique visitors. You're asking, you want every ASIN to perform with a minimum of 1,000 sessions. Your session conversion, that's the number of people that go to it and actually buy it. Every ASIN needs to, confer, uh, to convert at a minimum of 10%. 30 is great, less than 10%, you want to stop selling. And we'll get into that in a minute. Stop selling, you mean? Yeah, we'll get there in a second. And then profit. You absolutely have to establish a profit range. And the reason why I say range is because depending on when and how old the ASIN is, your profit's going to vary. So when you first launch a product, you're probably not going to be making any money. You're going to be spending a bunch of money in driving traffic to it, SEO, pay-per-click, all of that sort of stuff. You would agree with that 100%. And then you, have a, then you have a time frame. So three months, you're not making any money. Next three months, maybe you're breaking even. Next three months, maybe you're starting to drive, make a profit, right? So you have to have a really unique pricing strategy. But you have to have a profit range. Because I'm going to come back to this in a couple minutes. If you're not making any profit, you're not going to grow your business. Free cash flow is the number one most important thing to your Amazon business. Because the more cash you have, the more you're able to buy inventory, or the more you're able to pivot quickly and buy into other inventory. You've got to have cash. I can't tell you how many sellers I've worked with who are like, oh, I'm doing 20 million. I'm like, oh, that's great. Let's crunch the numbers and you're generating 10% profit. It's like, that's a lot of work for 100 grand. So you have to have an individual ASIN strategy. And for resellers, that also includes a buy box share. So you establish a floor of how much buy box percentage you want. So this is great. So let's look at it. If you're doing 100 sessions, with a minimum of 10% conversion, you're going to be selling 100 units a month, right? Pretty basic math. You sell 100 units a month. Say your average sale price is $29.99. It's going to be about three grand a month. It's going to generate you about $36,000 a year, one ASIN. You do that 20 times, and you're at $720,000 a year. It's pretty basic math, right? It's not hard, but it's incredibly hard. And why is that? It's because these ASINs, they don't perform equally. That's why you need to have an individual strategy for every one. So if you're not getting enough sessions, you need to figure out why. And then you need to make changes. You're going to need to increase sponsored products, update keywords, search, 
off Amazon advertising. You've got to do something to get traffic to the ASIN. It doesn't matter if you try to reprice it. It doesn't matter if you update detail page. If no one's looking at your product, no one's going to buy it. Your session conversion, if you're not getting that minimum 10% conversion, it's because something's wrong. Either there's errors on the detail page, the detail page sucks, no pictures, bad bullets, it got hijacked, uh, the title's wrong, product reviews, it's priced incorrectly, maybe you need to run some promotions, you've got to do something to start getting that conversion. The buy box, same thing. You've got to adjust pricing, run promotions, move it into FBA. If you're not going to be able to get it, stop selling. Profit. If you're not in that profit range, you need to stop selling because you're not making any money. Doesn't matter. So, all ASINs are not created equal, right? Every ASIN could and should be performing at the same level, but they don't. So, let me introduce you to the head, the torso, and the tail. This is your catalog. This is how your catalog performs on Amazon. The head. It's the top 20% of your catalog. Everyone in here know the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle. 20% of your catalog drives 80% of your sales. Your head selection is the most important. It's the most valuable selection on the catalog. This is what Amazon wants. Amazon is working very diligently with these brand owners to create these hybrid relationships where retail is going and saying, hey, Michael Kors, we want your head selection. We want the top 20% of your catalog, the stuff that's coming out right now, and we'll gate that so retail is the only one who can sell it. And 3P, you can have the other half, the other two thirds, which is the torso, and the last, the tail. I think this is my favorite slide I've ever created. <laughs> Anyone ever heard of this? Other than Eddie, because I talk crazy amounts to him. You've heard it? So this is how your catalog performs. Head, torso, tail. Amazon's really interested in the head selection because that drives all the money. That drives all the profit. Torso and tail, they don't really care about. Tail, they sip it, they really don't care about. So what are we looking at? The head selection. This is your top 20%. These are the most important ASINs in your catalog. The 80-20 rule is here, the Pareto principle. This is generating approximately 80% of your sales. I've seen this where I've seen a seller who has 900 SKUs, four are generating almost 80% of their revenue. These are high velocity ASINs, so they've got high BS or low BSR, they're selling through really quickly. The profit can vary because of that. Uh, if you're a reseller, there's usually high competition on this. You're competing heavily for the buy box. You can never run out of stock on these ASINs. Your business will suffer significantly. You can never get them su suspended. I've worked with a lot of sellers where they get their top or two or three ASINs suspended, and they're like, oh, well, it's not that big a deal. It's not my whole account. Well, it might as well be, because it's 90% of your revenue. So this is your goal for every ASIN. So you want every ASIN to be performing as your head selection. The problem is, is they can't. And then there's the torso, the middle of your catalog, that's 70%. This is where you start making adjustments. This is your opportunity. This is where... Uh, your business can sustain stock outs on these things. So if you do run out of stock, it's not a big deal. Uh, or not as big a deal. If they get suspended, again, it's not as big a deal. Lower velocity. Uh, the profit range can tend to be consistent. Uh, oops. ASINs, uh, this is where ASINs, they're either going in one direction or another. They're either going to start moving closer to your head selection or they're going to start moving closer to your tail. And if they're moving closer to your tail, it's very possible that these will end uh, there's ending life cycle ASINs where they've just run their course. They're old styles, something new. Your competitors come out with something better. So you have to have a good understanding of what's going on with this catalog selection. And then there's your tail. This is the bottom 30% of your catalog. You need to be asking yourself, why am I selling this? The tail selection is what Amazon refers to as crap ASINs. Can't realize any profit. 
They don't want any tail. Because Amazon is all about the profit contribution, the positive cash flow that I go back to in the beginning, right? They want ASINs that are selling quickly and driving profit because that's what flows more cash into the business and that's what allows Amazon to do everything that they're doing. Biodomes, drones, all of that cool stuff. So you have to know what's going on in your catalog and you have to start eliminating them. You have to stop selling these. This is really hard to do, really hard to run your business like this because you are emotionally invested in it. It's very similar to stock market <laughs> strategies where you've lost money on stock and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't sell it. I've lost money, I, I, it's gonna come back, it's gonna come back. Most of these ASINs are never gonna come back unless they're brand new, whatever, right? But you need to have this type of strategy. What's the next one? So, uh, my it's actually pretty short, shorter than I thought it was me. So one of the things that I think is really important is you need to stop. The reason why I was able to be successful going from 12 to 40 is I stopped thinking about myself. I didn't say to myself, I'm a $12 million business that's got to get to 40. I started telling myself, I'm a $40 million business that's underperforming. Where are my gaps? How do I fix them? And how do I do it quickly? So that's one of the pieces of advice that I would give to you guys. The second that I will give to you is you have to stay on target. Come on, please work. Oh, is there audio? Oh good, I can't maneuver. Stay on target. We're too close. Stay on target. Stay on target. Stay on target. Loosen up. Stay on target. Stay on target. Stay on target. Loosen up. Stay on target. Stay on target. Stay on target. And that inevitably is what happens if you don't, right? Your business, like my PowerPoint, crashes. Okay, so it was relatively short, lots of stuff in there. I wanted to save a lot of time for questions. Uh, as I mentioned, this is who I am, uh, PK Consulting, we do all of that stuff. And then I'm launching this small uh, Amazon Insider Mastermind group. Um, questions, fire away. You like to chase it well. So that's a really good question. It's like how do you get how do you start basically, right? And it's gonna start in tail because it's slower ASINs. And that's where it comes down to you've got to have that profit range and you've got to have a pricing strategy because you need to come in with a strategy where you know you're gonna sell it at this point, at this price, for this period of time. You're gonna do all these inputs, drive traffic to it, and hopefully start moving it into that torso and tail. Does that make sense? Yeah. You have to have those established goals. You have to know that, okay, I'm launching a brand new product and it's going to ASP for $30. And my cogs on it are 10. And so I know that I'm gonna to have to build in other, other uh, you know, fees on it, FBA inbound fee, that sort of stuff. And I know that I'm gonna be selling it for a period of time and I'm gonna be driving traffic to it. I'm gonna be pulling all these levers to try to get that, the sessions up and then I'm gonna get the conversion up and then that's where it starts to move out of that. They're gonna fluctuate, things are gonna move it's also because of the competition on the ASINs, new products that get launched, that sort of stuff. In the back. Uh, what would you suggest as an optimal ASP range? An optimal ASP range? That's a good question. It's gonna start with what it costs to get the product and what your competition is doing. What's the marketplace look like? If you're selling a product that is $20 and everyone else has it for 10, uh, that could be a, a challenge, right? Because you're too high. It's not impossible. Nest is a really good example. The Nest thermostats, you can buy a programmable thermostat at Home Depot for like 30 bucks, right? And Nest comes to the marketplace with something for 200. It's still the same thing. It's just fancier and looks better. What they did was tell their story in their detail page really well and give the customer the reason why it needs to be, why you're willing to pay a little bit more for it. Yes. I have a question. When you run out of stock on those uh, top uh, selling products, 
Does it, how does it affect the, the search on those products? So when you run out of stock on top, on your head selection, how does it affect search? I mean, is it when I, when it, when I have it back in stock, is it, am I still going to retain my, my spot? Yeah, so search, obviously, it's going to impact your bestseller rank, which is dynamic and in real time as people buy it, as they search for it, as they click it, as they interact with your detail page, all of that sort of stuff matters. If you're out of stock on an ASIN, it doesn't happen. They're not interacting with your ASIN. Unless, here's the thing, are you wholesale, are you reseller, or are you private label? If you're private label, you never want to run out of stock. You want to slowly, if, you're, if you see your velocity is taking off, your product is really, you know, like, whoo, it was on Oprah, or if, if there was Oprah still, right? But it's on Shark Tank. Amazon's contacting you to buy your product in through retail. So Amazon's asking, you, they're telling you that you want to do that. The that they like my product. They think that they could do millions. Sure. Or they want to sell it. Sure. So what's wrong with that? I'm asking. I keep running out of stock. Okay, so you keep running out of stock. You need a better replenishment program then. You need to go upstream. Those five whys. Why? Okay, you're running out of stock. Why do you keep running out of stock? Well, because I'm getting help from Amazon to drive traffic to my listings because I have a, a strategic account manager who's working with me. Okay, great. So why, what do I need to do to make sure that I'm not running out of stock? You can dynamically start changing your price slowly to slow the velocity, but if you've got these sorts, that's a great problem to have and I would be figuring out how to get your product into the system faster. You need a better FBA replenishment program. Yes, sir. Sure. I don't know the answers. I, 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 I'm, I'm not a, I wasn't a vendor side. I wasn't on the retail side. I can speculate on a few things. So um, he, the question was, is if you're competing with Amazon, how are they repricing and what are some of the things that you want to be looking at and why are they doing what they're doing? So one of the big things is uh, FC capacity. So they will actually be looking at how much uh, volume in an FC that this ASIN is taking up and then they will reprice accordingly based on what's coming in and what's going out. And so if there is an ASIN that is not, they overbought and they uh, can't fluctuate or get the sale to go and by dropping the price and get the sell through to go through, um, then they will you know, continue to drop the price, lower the price. Uh, they'll also just return it uh, to, the, to the vendor, which they've done before, and then they'll turn around and buy it again from the vendor. Um, <laughs> But a lot of it has to do with that. A lot of it also has to do with, depending on what your product is, uh, image competitors. So if you are selling, uh, if it's being sold on Target or Nordstrom or any of the image competitors, Walmart, they'll actually go out, look at what's going on there, and they don't care. They're going to want to reprice it and get it down because the number one thing for them is making sure that they're able to keep the customer on Amazon, giving them a good experience. And if they go off Amazon, buy it for a less expensive price, it's a bad customer experience. Mindy? Um, so that report that you said about uh, looking at ASIN profitability, is, that, is there one that can do for a parent ASIN? So there are no reports in Seller Central that can are you give you profit. make sure you repeat the question? But oh. I'll start following around with a mic. Sure. Do you want to hear? Thanks. Uh, that's the ASIN profitability. Right. If there's a way to look at it as a parent ASIN, especially when you're in the clothing category. Yeah, so the thing about profit is there is no reports in Seller, uh, seller Central to, to uh, report on profit. So you either have to use a tool. Um, seller Labs has a profitability tool, Quantify, right? Uh, there's other uh, solution providers out there that can, can give you profitability. Um, and then the, or if you're an Excel wizard, you can use uh, VLOOKUP, uh, export your detail page, sales and traffic report, use VLOOKUP, pull your um, profit in, your COGS in, and build a template through that. Um, and as a parent, yeah, you would just aggregate the data of the child ASINs and then put it to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yep. Question. Oh. And that, wait, one, one question. That's also, in apparel, it's really hard to create that ASIN strategy and that profitability strategy because there's colors that are variants that, some, that like no one wants that that color, and or there's sizes like 
really big sizes, really small sizes, that people don't buy the same. But you want to have that stuff available. And so one of the things I didn't, that I forgot to add in is your ASIN strategy cannot, it, it, it can be, it doesn't necessarily have to be about sales and it doesn't necessarily have to be about profit. It can be about uh, sizing to make sure that you have it available. It can also be about positively contributing metrics to your seller account. You may be selling an ASIN that it sells great. You're the only one on it. It doesn't make very much money or any money, but everyone loves it. You get zero returns. They write five-star reviews about it. It's really good, positive contribution to your overall account. So your strategy can be like, hey, this, account, this ASIN rocks and it really helps my account. So that's why I'm selling it, even though I'm not making any money. The thing that's really important and what I want you to do is you should be able to go line by line through your catalog and know exactly why you're selling it. It makes this profit range, it drives this sessions, it creates this positive uh, contribution to my account. It's because it's a size that no one else has and I wanna make sure that my customers get it because somebody buys it four or five times a year. The key to that is if it's a size that somebody's gonna buy four to five times a year, you have very thin inventory on it. You don't have a ton of capital tied up in it. And the problem with that tail inventory is if you've got a ton of capital tied up in it, how do you free that up? Was there? Yeah. yeah. Um, at what point do you decide what, when something goes from the torso to the tail? Like what's the data that would make that decision? Because there's a lot of times where you have products that are slow moving. Let's say you overbought a large lot and it's about to incur long term storage fee. The problem is you can't resend it to FBA for sure. like six months or a year. Do you pay that fee and let it sell out? What's, the, what, what's your strategy between moving something from the middle end to the so back the, end. So the, the moving from torso to tail to head, that's not a strategy, that's a reality. And so you're gonna look at your catalog and you're gonna see the top 20% is doing this, the, the torso is at 70 and the tail is at 30. You're going to see where it falls into your, it's a, the cohort of your catalog that is generating that type of output. And so you have to look at it uh, and one other strategy is to put a timeline on your inventory. So you're only gonna sell it for six months. I used to be very um, adamant that you needed to give your inventory at least 12 months so it could go through the whole cycle, right? The whole holly, uh, holiday peak, Q4. I'm, I'm more six months now um, because of Prime Day, uh, which supposedly uh, Prime Day stuff uh, offers and everything get approved, start getting approved in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and if you don't have inventory going in for Prime Day, if you don't have a Prime Day strategy right now, uh, I would start thinking about it today. Um, but now because of Prime Day, you've got that six month window where you've got the December peak and then you've got that uh, July peak. So if, if you sell through a whole you know, period like that and you're not able to see it move in one direction or another, you probably just need to get it out. Back here. And then up front. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so you're talking about private label yep. um, products and staying in stock. So I've kind of heard two theories and wanted to get clarification on what you said. Yeah. Um, as far as either slowing down the um, slowing down the stock up by raising your price and lowering the velocity or going out of stock at a better, you know, bestseller rank and then getting better rank when you come back because you went out of stock at a bestseller rank. So sure. you're saying that it's always better to slow down the velocity? No, not necessarily. So the one thing I've learned is what I've said and what I've seen and what I've done may not work right for your business and, and there's, there's so many different ways to do this, right? And so what I have seen is when sellers who have uh, really good ranking products and their, their, their best seller rank is starting to improve and then they run out of stock and then they're out of it and then the best seller rank will go from you know, 10,000, 50, 100 and then it, it, it's just hard to regain that because it costs money to drive traffic to that ASIN and get it back. So depending on how long it's out of stock for, I mean, if you're out of stock for a couple of days, it's probably not gonna be that big a deal. A month, I would probably try to avoid that. But you, but you also run the risk of if you raise your price too much, too quickly, that it's the same thing as out of stock because then that conversion stops, to happen, uh, stops happening and then that can impact your search. I couldn't tell you if he asked if the if the if the uh, 
sales ranking was, is it, if it's known, if it's based on ranking. Uh, I mean on uh, out of stocks. Is it more about, so I don't know. Um, I'm not on that, I was never on that team. All of those uh, proprietary algorithms were never discussed. Anyone that tells you they know exactly what it is, uh, they're either violating, they're a former Amazonian, Amazonian violating their NDA, um, and, or they don't really know and they're speculating. I can tell you that the way that Amazon thinks is that they are so customer obsessed. They are hyper about the customer experience. And so search is gonna be impacted by the customer experience. So if they're looking at a detail page and buying it, then it's gonna help with rank because it's a great customer experience because they're actually buying it. If they're just looking at it, it's not necessarily gonna help. But I know that there are some things out there, some, some like black hat type of tactics that can supposedly, you know, add to wish list, add to cart, remove it, move around on the page, that sort of stuff that can impact it. I don't know, uh, I don't you know, support those things, I don't talk about them, I don't know how to do it. But from the customer obsession perspective, it would make sense that conversion would impact sales rank. Yes, sir. Uh, when you're looking at the detailed page and you've got, you know, let's say you got a parent uh, listing with yes. 20 colors and five sets, so yep. you got 100 day signs. Yep. So how do you, when you say, you know, you're looking at each like session per A sign, you want to fill those sizes, but not every size is going to convert at the those. same level. So how do you, what's your approach with that? You got to be really lean on your inventory. So the black is your, probably your favorite uh, color, your favorite seller, or some sort of, you know, evergreen type of color or product, right? Where you're just selling a lot of it, but then you've got that really, and you, so that one, maybe you're 10,000, 100,000 units deep on. But then you've got this random one-off color that no one really buys very often. You need to be really lean on it. You can sell it. There's no problem with selling it. You just so that's not going to hurt the listing with the lower conversions and stuff, but you want to still make it available. It's not going to surface as much because of that, that child ASIN isn't as popular as the other one, but it's not going to hurt you. Okay. Unless you've got 10,000 units and a you know, quarter of a million dollars in inventory sitting on it no one's selling, and you're not selling it. I mean, that's going to hurt you. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to call out. I'm going to call somebody out because we had a conversation last night, and I actually warned him that I was going to call him out. So this is my friend Kevin, and uh, Kevin and Peter and I were actually having this conversation last night. Yep. And what I and and so I want Kevin to kind of share um, his strategy because I think when we were talking about it, and I actually said, "Will you share it?" And he said, "Yes." So I'm not like really calling him out. And, um, and also, I think you might have something you want to share to Laurent's answer, too, because I know we talked about that as well. So, sure. and, and I think the point of this is, is that Peter's a really intelligent guy, and a lot of the speakers we're putting on stage are intelligent people, but a lot of you in the room are intelligent, too. So if right. you have your own answer to the question of what you do that's different, feel free to raise your hand and share with the audience what you do, because that's part of this experience as well. So to answer your question back here about the raising the price or going out uh, when you're going out of stock, what I do is actually close the listing. Actually, it's scary to do that, uh, but you actually close the listing because Amazon, from what I can tell, and like he said, it's all theory, but it, they have multiple different averages where they do by the hour, by the day, three day, seven day, um, 30 day, and so on. So what I do is actually go in and close the listing. And what that does is kind of pauses it where the data stops collecting. Because if you go out of stock, the data keeps collecting. And so it affects that average and your BSR drops. So what I found when I come back into stock um, and reopen the listing, I come back almost right where I left off within a couple days. Um, how, long, so, how long do you let yourself be out of stock on something? I'm typically not out of stock more than a month. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that might not work if you're out of stock for six months or something, I can't guarantee that. But I've used that strategy several times and it works. That's actually from uh, Casey Goss at BioLaunch. I actually discovered that because he has all that data. Um, but from doing whatever, 15, 20,000 launches. So, Kev so Kevin, somebody has a question about your, que about your, about your answer. So Sure. Yeah. So Casey told me the same thing and I heard you say it on your podcast. But when we've actually gone to do it, we've always got inbound, inbound inventory in most cases, or we've got a business price on there and you can't close it. 
Or yeah, you can, you can actually, uh, well, if, you, if you're completely out of stock, you can close it. I do it all the time. And then you can't edit the listing. When you're out of stock, you can't go in there and like mess with it. So if you need to send in new inventory, you actually have to reopen it, send in the inventory, and then close it again. So all you have to do to reopen it is just edit it. You just edit it and just change something, you know, and then change it back or whatever, and that re reactivates it. And only once have I had it not actually reactivate, I actually um, then had to call our support you know, and say, hey, can you reactivate it? He, uh, the, and that's another question up here. He wants to know, how do you close the listing? You go into your, just, and just like you're going to ship in inventory, and um, you, you actually click the little checkbox, um, and you just, then you pull down the little pull down, and it says, close listing. It's scary. A lot of people don't want to do it. They're like, oh, man, I don't want to lose all my pictures. I don't want to lose everything. But it works really good for me. Will you jump? Will, if you guys want to learn more about that, you, you guys can grab Kevin during one of the breaks, but I want you to share with the audience your, uh, we'll call it your ASIN strategy. So where Peter was sharing the, the three boxes of how he does his math, you had kind of shared yours of, of what your statistics look sure. like. So what I, what I do on all my, I do only private label. I have five different brands. So what I do on my products um, is I have a rule that I give it six months. So basically I, I never order less than a thousand units on a new product um, because I, and I assume that on those thousand, I'm not gonna make a dime. I assume that I'm going to be giving them away, starting with a lower price, raising it. So just hope to break even. So once I've done that, <clears throat> I have the second order come in. I give it six months. So within six months, my rule is kind of what like he was talking about. He said, I'm not making $2,000 profit per month on that ASIN. I drop it. So that's kind of like what he was saying, his, his tail. So that's just my criteria. You may have different criteria, but that's how I do it because it's just not worth putting money into it. The ROI is not higher. I can take that same money and put it somewhere else and get a better return. So that's, that's what I do. Um, and then as far as determining my ASIN strategy on, on my products, uh, I have a, to determine what works. I, and like what he was talking about on the, on the big data is I use the search term reports. Um, I disagree with one thing he said about the 10% to drop a product if, if it's less than 10%. I have a uh, conversion rate. I have one that's about 7%. And it's one of my top SKUs. So it gets a lot of long tail traffic that kind of messes with that session conversion percent. But it's a very profitable item that does half a million dollars a year. Um, so I'm not going to drop it. But my strategy on determining how to target and the keywords that I use is I use the big data. I use the search term reports. So when I, I, I download those, and I typically use 120 days. Um, and I'll combine everything together. So I'll run. A, a manual uh, P, uh, PPC with all three, the broad, mat, uh, broad match, phrase, and exact, and an auto all at the same time, and I'll keep, I'll keep running them. And I don't really care about the A cost at all. Um, only if it's like way out of hand, like a thousand percent or something, I'll discontinue it. But I keep running it to get the data. And then what I do is I combine all those, those data points, download the spreadsheet, and I have some Excel stuff where I combine everything together. So if I have a keyword that's converting in phrase and it's also converting in auto, I put those, merge those together and merge all the data together to get an overall average. Um, and then what I do is I, I go through and I look for anything that has at least 1,000 impressions on PPC that has a click-through rate of 0.4% or higher, uh, that has two or more sales, and has a conversion rate of above 10%. And that tells me that those are the keywords that I should be targeting. And so then they'll go through if I'm doing a viral launch or if I'm doing any other kind of targeting or if I'm going to change my title or change my listing or my bullets or the back end. That's, that's the data I use. And it's, it works very well. So that's how I analyze the big data. Is Thank that what you. you wanted? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank sure. you. I saw you guys all frivolously taking notes on that. And so that's obviously going to be on the recording. but. Um, just to, I think, we're going to do one last question here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. So, oh, okay. I thought there was one last question up front. So you want to? What's that? Oh, Barbara. Okay. We'll do one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. It's always good to end on a question. So you you raised an interesting point with the big data and going through and pulling all that content down and and, and aggregating it, and I've been running bunch of um, search term, you know, automatic and manual campaigns trying to get all this data. And then I 
this is a shameless um, plug for our scope. Then I took scope down and I'm like, why am I running all this stuff over here, campaigns for a month and doing all that? And I'm looking on my other screen, I'm like, those are the keywords. And let me look at six more ASINs that are competitive and online. Is there something that I'm missing when I'm doing that? Am I short? Well, that, that's true. So. I don't think there's anything that you're missing. I think that the, the, the point of it really is, is that there's multiple ways to, uh, to, to attack this, right? And I think what Peter and I were saying up there um, as Kevin was, was finishing was he has a strategy. Like that's the, that's the point that you guys need to take from all this is that he has a strategy. He's figured out his game plan. At the beginning of the conversation, we said who has a strategy and Jamie was the only one that rose, raised their hand, but Kevin, you have a strategy, right? And so that's what you need to be thinking about. That's the point of why we started with this presentation because by starting with this presentation, you now understand that you need to have a strategy in what you're doing and that everything from that point forward needs to be built off of that strategy. Yeah, and that's the thing is his strategy was talking about how a conversion rate of less than 10% works for that particular product. And I completely agree, but the thing is, is he does have that strategy. He's been able to create that baseline and then adjust it from there. Um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this was fantastic. And I just have one last question for you. As the beginning, you wrote down your goal and how you were going to get there, uh, get there, and if you were yellow, red, or green. Has anyone started to think that maybe you're changing your goal now? or changing how you're gonna get there? Anyone wanna say yes or no? No, crickets, okay. Buy him a drink, buy him a drink, buy him a drink tonight and he'll, uh, and, and share. Thank you, Peter.